Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker who came to us all the way from the other place. It's Jack Ashby, uh, who is the Assistant Director of the Cambridge Museum of Zoology. So he will be here to talk to us about Australian mammals, not just about platypus, but uh, I have a hint that it might be one of his favourites. Um, he is also the Art Fund Headley Fellow researching colonialism and colonial history of Australia, um, and he's affiliated with the UCL as well. So he is a man of uh, many talents. And of course, at the end, there will be an opportunity to buy yourself a copy of a book that he published last year. Um, he's also published previous books, so it's not the only one, but he's got <laughs> copies of this one. Uh, and of course, there will be an option to get it signed. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Jack Ashby. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna and Alison as well for inviting me here. Thank you to all of you for, for coming. So, yeah, my, um, my interest is very much about this, but it won't be the only feature of the talk, but it will be quite a significant feature of the talk. Um, but just to introduce myself a bit more, I'm, I'm interested in a few things. Um, one of them is uh, how, well, particularly Australian mammals, so Australian mammals and their natural history, but not just from a natural historical point of view, but also from a historical point of view. So how the world has come to know Australian mammals and how our history of, of talking about them in the West has shaped their, kind of their place in the world today and, and their conservation. I'll get to that towards the end. As you kind of mentioned, I'm also doing a research fellowship at the moment looking at the colonial history of the Australian mammals um, we have in Cambridge, a University Museum of Zoology, and that is really looking at who really collected these specimens when we say it was this famous, you know, male, white, rich hunter, uh, hunter scientist, <laughs> who was actually doing the work and what circumstances were involved. So these are arguably the best collection of thylacine skins in the UK, in our museum, if not the world, um, were, were sent to us by a um, solicitor in Hobart, Tasmania, who was also responsible for sending more uh, Aboriginal Tasmanian skeletons to Europe than any other person. So this is intertwined history of natural history and cultural history uh, that I think is really interesting. But if you have a picture with me of Tasmanian devils, we'll see more devils later. And um, so I spend a month or two a year in Tasmania doing, oh, and mainland Australia, uh, doing field work. So it's this mix of cultural history and natural history, but also museums. Um, so I'm the assistant director of the, of the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, and so I'm particularly interested in how those things come together in museums and how museums present nature to the world. And, I, and in fact, if you'll excuse the plug, uh, um, that it, all of those things come together in this book, and this is what Joanna and Alison invited me to talk about today. So what um, amazing things can I tell you about Australian animals, but also what, I hope, interesting things I can tell you about how uh, we have come to know uh, platypuses and echidnas and marsupials uh, in the West. Um, and that's the theme of this book. But to start with the cover star, uh, unquestionably the best animal that has ever evolved. Um, it is not controversial, it is not arguable. Um, if I have failed to convince you of that uh, by the end, then you know, that's fine. Uh, obviously, it is subjective. <laughs> so, platypuses are. I'm going to shoot a few pictures of platypuses and videos of platypuses. What this one shows us is the amazing things they do. You might, if you know anything about platypuses, you might think I'm going to start talking about eggs and venom and electricity, and I will. But I'm going to start by talking about teeth. Now, I don't know about you, but teeth are a terrible invention. Um, they, the problems that we mammals have with teeth are really debilitating. I don't know how many of you have had dental problems, but probably quite a lot of you. Um, and now, Mammals have done something quite strange with their teeth, and that's that we only have two sets of them. So we have a milk tooth and we have our adult teeth. And the reason for that is that we've evolved very, very complex teeth that fit together really, really tightly in really quite uh, amazing ways that allow us to grind and cut and crush all at the same time. Um, and that means that we can't keep changing our teeth because they'll no longer fit together if we share the bottom tooth but not the top tooth. So we've only got these two sets of teeth. But that comes with massive problems if you're a long-lived animal eating hard foods. So platypuses 
have solved this problem by completely getting rid of their teeth. They eat really hard food, so they can eat their entire body weight in crayfish in a day, almost, um, and smash them up. They eat uh, worms, which are softer, but they come with mud and, gr and uh, silt. And so that what they've done, you can see inside uh, this chap's mouth, he's got these, these hard um, bridges. Is this a laser? Is this a laser on him? This is doing laser. Okay. There is a laser. Oh, oh I can't coordinate myself. Um, so these little horny ridges are made of horn, so the same material as your fingernails and your hair. And these are worn down constantly through the platypus's life, because as I say, they eat crayfish, they smash up these crayfish, which they stuff into little cheek pouches. It's very cute, kind of like a hamster, but I get told off and I tell people off for comparing Australian mammals to European mammals. Um, but they have these cheek pouches, they forage at the bottom of the uh, lakes and rivers in Australia, pack their cheeks full of worms and crayfish and mollusks and fish, and they come to the surface and they, they chew them up. But all the while, this, their, their horn is getting um, worn down. It's growing back at the same rate. So amazing things that platypuses can do with their bills. But um, as you probably know, it's not the most amazing thing they can do with their bill. This is a platypus I met uh, a few months ago, uh, just on the edge of Hobart. Um, so platypuses are one of the only mammals that can detect electricity. In fact, the only mammals that can detect electricity are platypuses, their relatives, the echidnas, which I'll talk about. And one species of dolphin, as far as we know, the Guyana, the Guyana dolphin, can detect the electrical fields given off by all other animals. So, as you probably know, if you remember from, from biology classes, every single muscular contraction in the animal body is controlled by electrical signals running through our nerves and muscles. Now, platypuses shut their eyes and ears underwater in this little muscular groove running down the side of their heads. Uh, no other animals pair their eyes and ears in this way, the same as a platypus does. They shut their eyes and ears in this groove. Uh, it means they can't see and they can't hear, um, but they can sense the world in the electrical signals of all of the animals around them. Um, so they can hunt down all of these animals just by sensing their heartbeats through the electrical signals going up by the heartbeats, also if they're moving. Um, and they do that with electroreceptors in their bills. So their bills are, are pretty special. Um, the most famous thing about platypuses, of course, is that they lay eggs. And we'll talk about this quite a lot. But platypuses and echidnas are the only egg-laying mammals. Um, it's often thought that a defining feature of mammals is that they produce live young. Um, the Oxygen mammal group, so you probably know that's not necessarily true because we have these five examples, but I'll, I'll get to why that caused a bit of problems for um, natural historians of the past. Um, but the other interesting thing about them is that although um, they're mammals and therefore by definition produce milk, they don't have nipples. So they just sweat their um, milk out of their milk glands straight onto their fur and the babies lap it up. That kind of makes sense. And in fact, if platypuses did have nipples, and they would never have evolved because to uh, use a nipple, you need to attach to it um, and you need to form a seal around the nipple. And if you've got a beak, um, that's quite a hard thing to do. So if they would have had nipples, that would never have happened. There are a couple of other mammals that can't suckle, um, for example, hippos and whales. And they're, they're, hippos use their tongue to form a seal around the nipples and whales pump their milk uh, out of their nipples into the baby's mouth. But platypuses just ooze it onto their fur and um, echidnas, and the babies suck it up from there. Um, so that, that's pretty interesting. And that means, incidentally, that platypus milk is being studied for its antibacterial properties because nipples are a sterile delivery device where milk goes straight from inside the mother into inside the baby without being contaminated much by the outside world. Platypuses don't do that. So their, their, their milk does get contaminated, so their milk has got really strong antibacterial properties, uh, which is being studied to solve the problem of hospital superbugs. Um, so another reason why they're the best animal that ever evolved. This is um, a platypus in Melbourne Zoo. Melbourne Zoo. Um, and I just want to show you in this video, in fact, you can see, I mentioned this, this muscular groove on their head, so that's the white patch by their eyes. It's got no fur on it, so when they are underwater, it, it closes shut, kind of like an eyelid, but that eyelid's got their ears in it as well. 
um, which is pretty astonishing. But the best thing about this video that, that I think it shows you is, is what they can do with their hands. They have, I like to describe them as kind of Swiss army knife hands or transformer hands, and that they've got adaptations to do lots of different things, different tools that they can fold out for different tasks. So they're obviously a semi-aquatic mammal, so they do part of their lives underwater, part of their lives on land, but they're also burrowing animals. So a female platypus, when she's um, digging her nesting burrow, can dig up to at least 10 metres, um, reliable reports saying up to 30 metres long. So this is a 50 centimetre long animal digging 10 to 30 metres into the soil. And the hands is the way, is the answer to how they live across those three different lives of on land, underground, and in the water. And what you can see here is their, their swimming is powered by their front legs. There's not many mammals that do that. Polar bears, fur seals, platypuses, and maybe more. Those are the only ones I can think of. Most other mammals power their, power their swimming with the back legs. Um, I'm not sure you put those three animals together, or at least polar bears and, and platypuses. It's a bit of a strange pairing. But anyway, what they do is they've got big hands, and then their hands have got webbing, but not like a duck's web. So a duck's web is, is runs in between the fingers. Uh, platypuses runs around the fingers, but it's not attached uh, to the end of it. And in fact, their webbing is longer than their fingers. Um, so what they do is when they paddle power stroke downwards, um, this webbing unfolds and they use their fingernails as kind of like struts um, to hold the um, webbing in place. But when they're doing the return stroke, when they bring their hands back, that webbing just collapses down, so it reduces the amount of drag. So it's an extremely efficient way of swimming. Um, and it's a huge paddle for the size of the animal. When they're on land, they fold that webbing up into a ball and walk on their knuckles. I think at one point he'll walk on his knuckles on the bottom of the, of the um, pod, of the, of the enclosure. Um, so they're walking without damaging their um, webs. And then when they're digging, they fold that back again. But they've got really long fingernails. So they can use their fingernails kind of like uh, garden um, forks to dig through the soil. So it is, as I say, a Swiss army knife of, um, of hands. You can also see the electroreception at work right here. They're doing his um, kind of like uh, metal detectorist sweeping backwards and forwards to detect those um, different... Um, electrical signals. And the final thing that's amazing about platypuses, I'm going to tell you, is that they are one of the only venomous mammals in the world. So the males have a quite a big horny spur on their ankles. It's about two centimetres long. And that spur is attached to a venom gland. And they use that um, for fighting between males over females. So the females are born, or, or hatch, should I say. They, in, ed in adolescence, they have spurs, but they fall off. They're not venomous. The males are venomous, so they're only venomous during the breeding season. So in fact, they're the only known seasonally venomous animal in the world. So there's a lot of only things that the platypus do. So one of the only venomous mammals, one of the only electroreceptive mammals, one of the only egg-laying mammals, they are the only mammal that does all three of those things. Um, those are incredible adaptations um, that I think makes them, as I say, the best... Uh, best animal that's ever evolved. They are so good at what they do that they live in pretty much every bit of Australia where there is permanent water. So their lives obviously require permanent water. They shut out almost every other mammal from that niche. They're so good at what they do. Um, that's the platypuses. The second, well, actually, it's the third best animal that's ever evolved. Is this uh, little chap here. Um, so this is an echidna, um, perhaps slightly less familiar than platypuses. So these are the only other egg-laying mammals. They evolved from platypuses um, probably about 50, years, 50 million years ago. Um, the youngest fossils are only about 15 million years for genetics, say. About 50 million years. And they, they are very charming little animals. So they can also detect electricity, which is quite a strange thing to do for a mammal that lives on land because you need water for the electricity to um, be to, to the current to run through. Um, and what's interesting is that they live in every single corner of Australia. These are the most widespread mammals in Australia, uh, including some of the driest places on Earth. So that they've got electroreception is pretty remarkable. We think they use it 
just when, when there is moisture in the soil, they can detect the electrical signals given off by they, these, these guys, mainly termites and ants. In New Guinea, this is, this is a short-beaked echidna in, in Australia. In New Guinea, we also get two, uh, three species of long-beaked echidna, um, and they mainly eat earthworms, and the soil is not a lot wetter there. And in fact, those species, where it's more tropical, have more electroreceptors. Um, that's not the only remarkable thing that they do. They've got the largest part of the brain that's responsible for smell. You can see this. This is a foraging echidna. He is um, trying to detect ants and termites in the soil. So it's walking every, you know, and every few meters, or stick his nose in the soil, give it a good sniff. If you find something, they they are extremely strong. I think we're about to see his feet uh, for for digging, and their front feet are massive. Um, and they can just push themselves straight through the soil. If you've got echidnas in your garden, you'll know about it because you just get these furrows uh, like someone has run a plough through the garden. Um, the most, my favourite thing about them is that it helps to dig too. But if you look, uh, when he starts walking, you'll see that his feet, back feet point backwards. Um, this is quite unusual. Uh, that, and this allows him to do two things. One of them is... Hedgehogs in Europe are famously flea-ridden animals. That, the reason for that is that it's really hard to groom yourself if you're covered in spines. Your, hand, your, your own spines work just as well against your own mouth and hands as they do against the predator. Echidnas have solved this problem. So those massive back feet, and they point backwards, and also in platypuses and echidnas, their um, arms and legs are actually held sideways out from their body, a bit like a lizard or a crocodile rather than straight under their body like every other mammal. This allows them to, it's quite disconcerting when you watch them do it, turn their back foot backwards and their back legs up around so they can scratch in between their shoulder blades um, with their toenails. Um, it looks like they've dislocated their legs, but they haven't. That's one amazing thing that that adaptation allows them to do, backwards point, pointing feet. The other is that when they're scared, if they're a little bit scared, I just, I, um, I just call it DEFCON 2. First thing they do is just, like a hedgehog, hunker down into a ball. So they've got a ring of muscle around their, their skirts, if you like. And when they pull that ring tight, it's like a drawstring of going around a melon, if you like. And it just pulls their legs and their heads into their bodies. That's DEFCON 2. If they're really scared, go to DEFCON 1. And they do jazz hands with all four feet and drill vertically into the soil. So they just disappear straight down um, into the soil. It is amazing. And once they're down there, it is impossible to pick them up if you're an ecologist or a predator. Um, but they lock those four feet, pointing in four different directions, into the roots and pebbles uh, underground. And it is, it is impossible to get them out. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, they're very clever little, little beasts. Um, so these, I hope, those, that is enough information to convince you that they are absolutely astonishing, perfectly adapted animals to their environment. However, that is not the prevailing view. Now, I've come to notice that people are very fond of these animals, but when I talk to them, I don't know about you, what, <laughs> what um, adjectives have come into your head whilst I'm talking? But when I talk to people about that, this is what I the first response I get isn't, that's so amazing, it's, that's so strange. Um, now, we, it seems, have been socially conditioned to think of platypus echidnas, but also all other Australian mammals, as weird. Weird and wonderful, yes, it's kind of a little bit celebratory, but weird nonetheless. Um, bizarre, odd, curious. Uh, and I'll just show you how prevalent this is. It's quite subtle, but it's there once you get attuned to it. So, not to, not to pick on the BBC, or the Natural History Museum, but, and I mean that, um, but as two of the biggest uh, windows we have onto the natural world, this is why I've chosen them. So this is um, BBC's big um, blue chip production, Seven Worlds, One Planet. Their um, Australia episode, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but I'll read it to you. The blurb for Australia said, Australia, the land cast adrift at the time of the dinosaurs, isolated for millions of years, the weird and wonderful animals marooned here are like nowhere else on Earth. That is a very common way of describing Australia. If none of that's true, Australia is not isolated, has never been isolated. At least half of the world's birds evolved in Australia and have flown to colonise the rest of the world. We, are, uh, we should be grateful to Australia 
for all songbirds, all parrots, all pigeons. That is the origin of, of Australia. Obviously, of, of songbirds, of those birds. Obviously, they're cheating a bit because they can fly and get out of Australia. But all of the world's mammals originated, or at least came through Australia. That's a long time ago, uh, about 200 million years ago. Very recent research, about a month ago, showed that the origin of mammals uh, would have been in the Southern Hemisphere and then filtered to Australia, what is now Australia, to colonise the world. But nonetheless, Australia has been connected to Antarctica, South America, and then through island hopping uh, to Asia. Half of Australia's mammals are Asian in origin. Half of the world's, half of Australia's mammals are bats and rodents. Um, so that's not true, but, but really I'm talking about weird and wonderful here. Uh, at the Natural History Museum is doing a talk about uh, mammals, and it says, join us 12 o'clock tomorrow um, to hear about mammals from the peculiar platypus to the humble hamster. What makes a, a platypus peculiar? Why is that the go-to word? And I just picked the New York Times as, a, as, as one example here of, of how it, they're, de, de, they're depicted in the press. This is over a six-month period. I've looked at the New York Times for platypuses. This is a news story that was about, I think, ichthyosaurs. So absolutely nothing to do with platypuses. And it, and it goes to platypuses as the world's oddest animal. And you thought the platypus was odd, it says. Another one, can the world's strangest mammal survive? This is a story about platypus conservation. And another one um, that was about platypuses uh, returning to certain habitats. The caption <laughs> describes platypuses as Dr. Frankenstein's first attempt. So all of these things, slightly playful, but there is a common theme. And then just to, to go to a, a typical museum display, this is the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, this is their display, it says up top there, early mammals. I doubt you can pick this out. <coughs> these are platypuses and echidnas. These are modern marsupials, so kangaroos and wallabies. All of these animals are alive. Um, not these animals, but all of these species <laughs> are alive. So what makes them early mammals? So by definition, marsupials are exactly the same age as placental mammals like us. We are each other's closest relatives. So we, we, we split at the same time. Platypuses and echidnas, they did split off before, uh, but they're not early mammals because they're alive today. My point here is, this is when we talk about platypuses as being primitive. This is a really common uh, misconception. And no living species can be primitive. All living species are equally evolved. They've all gone through the same amount of evolution. They're all perfectly adapted, very well adapted, if anything, are perfectly adapted to their habitat. So why do we keep throwing this primitive, uh, strange, weird idea? And my argument in Platypus Matters is that these are all hangovers from a very, very deeply ingrained colonial mindset that has harks back to when European naturalists went to Australia at the turn of the um, 19th, the 18th century and throughout the 19th century and the 20th century, and found animals that were different to what they knew in Australia, in Europe. And when they thought that's different to my hedgehog, my otter, whatever, they've immediately assumed that it's inferior to it. So they've used the European animals as the, as the zoological standard, and in not conforming to that standard, they've decided that they are worse uh, than them. So this is where the idea of primitive comes from. But where does that come from? So it was, it was his birthday yesterday, so let's talk about Darwin. Um, Darwin saw some platypuses uh, on his um, beagle, boy, beagle voyage uh, in 1839. And he said, I was reflecting on the strange creatures, um, a strange character of the animals in this country as compared to the rest of the world. An unbeliever in everything beyond his own reason might exclaim, surely two distinct creators have been at work. Um, John Gould, who is arguably um, the man most responsible for popularising Australian natural history in Victorian England, he wrote, uh, I may ask, has creation been arrested in this strange land? Uh, so um, all of these Victorian naturalists and earlier were describing Australia as if it's been cut off and kind of in this evolutionary backwater in evolutionary terms, obviously 1939 is pre-Darwinian um, evolution. Uh, and another one, this is William Kitchen Parker, who was an, an anatomist and a lecturer to the Royal College of Surgeons in 1885. Here is a beast, a primary kind of beast, a prototherian, whose general structure puts it somewhere at the same level as low reptiles and old sorts of birds, whatever that means. 
Um, they're all equally below the morphological level of the nobler mammalia. So we're painting European and American animals as noble and everything else as a primary kind of beast, a prototherian, an almost mammal. Now, I will admit, obviously platypuses are quite different to everything else. So when the Europeans first encountered them, the first platypus specimen came to um, Europe, to England, in 1799. And it caused a bit of a stir. And I, I, I totally understand that. It's, it is unlike everything. And as I mentioned, they lay eggs. This was a, one of the most controversial questions of um, the 19th century zoology. Is it possible for a mammal to lay eggs? So it certainly wasn't possible, considered possible for a mammal to lay eggs in 1799. Echidnas were first encountered in 1792. So a little bit earlier um, for, uh, for echidnas. Um, but those first specimens did give a little bit of a hint that something might be different with their reproduction. There were some people who were suggesting this looks like an egg-laying animal. So the first question was, can it lay eggs? Second question then came, became, if it can lay eggs, is it a mammal? Now, by, at that time, definitions of mammals for milk-giving live young, certain uh, aspects of the ankle, certain aspects of the jaw, Platypuses and echidnas did all of those things, but they look like they lay eggs. Um, so it became a massive controversy that a lot of people tried to solve over the course of the following century. Um, now, unsurprisingly, quite sensibly, a lot of those colonists asked Aboriginal Australians who had been living alongside them for 50 to 60,000 years, do platypuses and, lay and echidnas lay eggs? And indeed, unsurprisingly, they said, yes, they did. Uh, so George Cayley, who was one of the first naturalist specifically sent to be a naturalist um, over there. He said, I asked several natives at length I learned from one man, I think maybe relied on, who told me that they went uh, a long way underground and laid eggs. Several other uh, accounts from indigenous Australians came like that. Several accounts from Australia-based uh, European naturalists said, yep, they lay eggs, I've found eggs, I've got hatchlings. Uh, all of them were disbelieved. So people here, 12,500 miles away, thought they knew better, not only than the European naturalists in Australia, but the First Nations uh, Australians who had been there the whole time. Um, that's a classic colonial superiority complex that well, we've decided that mammals can't lay eggs, so therefore they don't lay eggs. Um, and in the end, it was only, it was, I'll, I'll be brief, because this is something I've spent a lot of time looking into. Um, it was only finally solved in 1884 when a Cambridge uh, embryologist called William Caldwell was sent to solve this particular problem with a massive amount of money from the University of Cambridge, a massive amount of money from the Royal Society, a massive amount of money from the government, and all of these letters of introduction to different colonial administrators to solve this question, um, because it was such a significant evolutionary question, if you can have mammals that have some reptilian, reptile-like characteristics, that was obviously a big story uh, for evolution. And he employed 150 Waka Waka indigenous Australians in central Queensland to kill 1,400 echidnas over the course of a couple of years. We don't know how many platypuses, but many. We always say, you know, museum collecting doesn't have an impact on uh, local populations. It's impossible to kill 1,400 echidnas in one area and it not to have it. Uh, local, uh, local impact. And nonetheless, he, he eventually caught an echidna with eggs in her pouch. Echidnas have pouches. Um, and he caught a platypus with one egg in her nest and another egg about to be laid in the mouth of her uterus. And that was the smoking gun. He sent a telegram from the British, Asso British Association for the Advancement of Science, who were meeting at that time in Montreal. So this is kind of like early tweeting from the field. He sent, it was described as the most important uh, scientific cablegram ever sent on undersea sea cables that showed that the platypuses were um, egg-laying, oviparous. Uh, when I moved to Cambridge, one of the first questions I asked is, where is the Caldwell collection? Because he killed 1,400 kidneys and he came back here to Cambridge with them. Um, and my colleague said, oh no, we've never heard of it. He's, he's not here. Um, but after about six months, uh, my colleague Matt Lowe uh, came along and was like, I found this. This box is, is 10 inches wide. As I mentioned, Caldwell was an embryologist, so he wasn't interested in the big animals, the mothers, he was just interested in the babies. And there were these kind of 12 little vials of 
Baby echidnas are called puggles. Um, so this is one of those puggles that proved that some mammals lay eggs. It's very, I was very excited about this day. You've got, this is the proof that it solved one of the biggest questions in, in 19th century evolutionary biology. Um, but the idea that, as I say, all of those people in Australia wouldn't be believed until they sent one of their own from the great imperial monoliths of the University of Cambridge and the Royal Society to solve this problem for them just shows that kind of that idea of colonial, how colonial science is done. Not that Australia wasn't allowed to have the scientific industry, it could only provide the physical labour, whereas European scientists um, were doing the intellectual work. Um, I'm going to move on to marsupials now because they are also wonderful. And I could give an entire talk about the second greatest animal to evolve, and that's wombats. Um, but I won't. Um, I'm just going to talk to you mostly about marsupial reproduction because that's what sets them apart. So I've talked about egg laying mammals, they're called monotremes, platypus and echidnas. I've mentioned placental mammals, that's what we do. So placental mammals is about 6,200 species of 6,500 species of mammal that are alive today. Um, what we do is we have really, really long pregnancies and then give birth to relatively large young who then finish off their infant growth by sucking milk on a teat. Marsupials do the opposite. So they um, give birth to really, really small young after a really, really short pregnancy and then do most of their infant growth by sucking milk on a teat. So really long uh, uh, suckling time, really short pregnancy. So this is inside a pouch of a Tasmanian devil. Um, uh, I don't do a lot of field work with Tasmanian devils. So this is where a lot of my examples are going to come from. But you can just see kind of how this works. What they do, there's that one, top right. <laughs> so um, some marsup well, marsupials have the shortest pregnancy of any mammals. The shortest pregnancy is, is 11 days. Um, so they'll produce a baby, honey possums, and some species of bandicoot are 11 days in the womb before being born, which means that when they are born, they are the quarter of the size of a grain of rice. So point, uh, two, uh, uh, 25 micrograms. Um, absolutely tiny. Devils, um, which, you know, an adult female devil is about eight kilos, they give birth after 21 days in the womb. Um, so the babies are about six millimeters long when they're born. These ones are probably about four weeks old. When all marsupials are born, such a short time in the womb. However, they are born with incredibly well-developed arms and incredibly well-developed lips. The back end looks a bit like a worm. Um, so these are, you can still see those, those strong arms. And the reason why they need that is because almost all marsupials, with the exception of bandicoots, um, have to climb from the vaginas to the pouch on their own uh, after, as I say, days in the womb. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I said vaginas. Uh, marsupials have up to three vaginas. So if you think about the human reproductive system, human female reproductive system, you have ovary, a pair of ovaries, a pair of fallopian tubes that meet in the womb. In marsupials, most marsupials at least, the pairing carries all the way down. So they have a pair of ovaries, a pair of fallopian tubes, and a pair of um, wombs that then have their own vaginas in uh, kangaroos and some others, there's also a third medial vagina that um, when they give birth, they grow a third vagina and give birth through that. Uh, and the, the, um, that can then seal up again and they'll use it again next time they're pregnant or they can uh, keep it open all the time. Um, but these babies, I think this is one of the most astonishing things in the natural world. That something that's been in the womb for days is so well developed that it can find its way. So it's got enough motor control and muscle control, I mean, it's got enough sensory ability uh, to find the right direction. We think they use smell because, as you can probably see in this video, the eyes are still closed, so they can't see, they can't hear. And the female, the mother, doesn't help them. She might, in kangaroos, she might lick a path. Um, we don't quite know why, but maybe that's an off a smell thing. Um, so it is amazing they get there. They've got really well-developed lips because when they reach the womb, or once they reach the pouch, they have to attach themselves to a... Teach, um, so that, that is important. So they've got very well developed bone structure around their jaws when they're born. Three weeks in the pouch in, in the case of a devil. I should say that not all marsupials have pouches. Um, so this is a northern quoll. So quolls are um, biggest quolls are about this big, the smallest quolls are about this big, the spotted 
carnivorous marsupials. There's six different species, four in Australia, two in New Guinea. Um, they don't have pouches, they just have a little fold of skin. So when, <laughs> so when they've got growing babies, so these babies just starting to get their spots, so again, they're probably about six weeks old, um, the mothers have to run on tiptoes to stop them hitting their bottoms on the ground as she runs. Uh, so we release, we release this one. She's, it's quite an amazing, an amazing way of walking when the little babies are just dangling beneath her because they're very low slung animals. Um, so that's another call. This is our wombat pouch for perhaps obvious mechanical reasons. Wombat pouches point backwards. And um, people say that, that so that they, when they dig, wombats are burrowing animals, when they dig, their pouches don't fill up with mud. I think there's a more straightforward reason for that, is that wombats are about this big, very, very short legs. Their babies are about this big. So if the baby had to climb underneath the mother and into the pouch, it wouldn't work, so it goes in back between her legs. Which is cute, because then you get these wombatlets, baby wombats, who stick their heads out and graze whilst they're being walked around. Um, in fact, the famous thing about wombats is they have cubic poo, which you can see in the photo. Um, and it's, it's considered important for baby wombats to eat their mother's poo to build up the gut flora to help them digest grass when they're older. So that's probably what this one is doing here. Um, kangaroos do something completely different um, and wallabies. So they um, will have, a, I call it, a, kanga, a conveyor belt of reproduction. So they're non-stop reproducers throughout their entire, well, they, can, they have several different age babies on the go. So at first you'll have, well, kind of, they're all at the same time, but one of them is a, a, a large uh, young at foot, so a large fully furred baby who lives outside of the pouch that keeps sticking its head in uh, to continue to suckle as well as grazing. So it's kind of a, a toddler, a uh, young so That's number one. There'll then be another baby in the pouch, a tiny, tiny newborn, like the one in the photo, who'll have its own teat. They, they, have, uh, they permanently attach, or uninterrupted, un, uninterrupted attach to their teats when they're in um, the pouch. So the, the baby newborn will have, different, have a different nipple and different milk to the uh, young crop on the outside. Soon after they give birth, and the hours after they give birth, they mate again, and they will fertilize another egg, and then they pause that fertilized egg. It's called embryonic di diapause. Um, so they have a, an egg, an embryo in stasis in one of their wombs, waiting for one of their teats to free up. So waiting for the young foot to be weaned. As soon as it's weaned, hormones kick in, and it hits go on developing that baby in their, in their um, womb. Five weeks later, it's born. Um, and then recently it was discovered that at least one species of kangaroo, a wallaby, a swamp wallaby, will have a different aged embryo in its other womb uh, at the same time. So swamp wallabies throughout their adult lives are never not simultaneously lactating and pregnant. So if times are good in Australia, they can be, they can be constantly producing these babies all the time. Um, now, Australian mammals in general get uh, painted as inferior. Um, the benefits of this system are not deserving of that uh, description. Um, basically, if you've got, it sounds emotionally callous to our human ears, if, if times are tough, so if there's a drought, if there's fire, there's not enough food, or if the mother's being chased, it's very, very easy to reach into the pouch and abandon the baby before you've invested too much um, resource into it. So early stages of development, um, if times are tough, they will abandon their um, baby. And that's really easy to do. Also, you don't have to carry them around the whole time. So these are, you can move that out, these are the massive baby's legs sticking out of the pouch. So I've scared it and it's jumped, like it's just disappeared into its mouth. Uh, and it's like too big. So they can, you know, if they, if they want to run up, at this point, they definitely wouldn't abandon their babies. That's obviously a lot of investment. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a big black wallaroo going in for a um, suckle. Um, so it's a good system. But nonetheless, uh, they still get these descriptions as being inferior. So this is one of the first descriptions, uh, first diaries coming back from the First Fleet after the British invasion in 1788, uh, where what contends described kangaroo production as against the, the contrary to the general laws of nature 
how, how an animal can be contrary to the general laws of nature. Those laws have obviously been written by Europeans. Um, but just to go into some specifics in, in my last um, few minutes uh, to, of what devils do, which, and quolls do the same thing, which I think is absolutely amazing. So on the left there is a female devil. She weighs about eight kilos. That's a very chubby female devil. Um, now in the natural world, in animals at least, there's kind of two different systems that you might see. And one of them I like to call the frog system, where you give birth to, you produce loads and loads and loads of babies in the hope that just statistically some of them will survive. So obviously frogs and a lot of fishes, corals, produce tons and tons of babies, knowing that most of them will die. This is how devils start off their system. So they will produce about 20 babies. Quolls will produce about 30 babies. So the, the combined weight of those 20 babies is, I've written this down, I think it's six grams. Yeah, so the combined weight of all the babies is, is, six, is four grams. So if you're an eight kilo devil, that's a very, very small investment, right? So they've produced so many babies because it's really hard to climb to the pouch and they know that even though they've got four teeth and because Devils, because marsupials can't share teeth, um, they'll only ever have a maximum of four babies. So they've produced 20, quolls will produce 30, they have six or eight teeth, um, in the hope that some of them will make the journey. The other system that we see in animals is what we do in mammals, and birds do it as well, typically, is have a very small number of babies and then invest a lot of resource in growing. That's the opposite to the frog system. Once they're in the pouch, devils then switch to the, you know, the bird system, if you like. So they're playing both games here. But once they're in the pouch, those babies will attach, those four babies will attach, and then they'll invest a huge amount of, well, the same, you know, the same amount of resources as any other mammal uh, in investing them. But they've played the odds game to get to that point, which I think is this evolutionary genius. It also produces the most adorable little baby devils. These are about four month old devils, they're just about to leave the pouch. In fact, from the same trip as this, we've got, this is the bottom of that, this is inside of another pouch. You've got two teeth at the top there, which shows that she's got adult, um, she's got large young back in the den, but one of them has been the clingy boy that day, mummy's boy, and he's the baby devil at the bottom, has decided to go out foraging with mum, and the other two have stayed at home in the den. So they will then, at this point, um, start staying at home whilst mum goes out hunting. So it's a really clever, system um, playing both games. And my very final, I think it's my final little story, is what one of the devil's relative, or in fact a few species of carnivorous mosquito and a few species of opossum in South America do. It's called suicidal reproduction. Um, it is a very unusual way of reproducing, but what happens is none of the males live to see their first birthday because they have so much sex that their bodies disintegrate. Um, and it's, it is, it doesn't sound like a very sensible thing to do, but it is the result of kind of an evolutionary game that the females are playing. What happens is all of the females, who will live through several breeding cycles, several, several years, all of the females come into heat at the same moment. And that causes a massive amount of competition between the males. So it produces sperm competition in particular, where they produce, uh, so um, species that have uh, that where a lot of females, or a lot of males are mating with the same females, have to have large amounts of sperm, effectively to flood the system of the females and increase their odds. They have very large testes, very large sperm volume, um, and also a lot of competition between males, so a lot of um, fighting. When all the females come into heat at once, the males have so much competition that they have to forego every other part of their life and, def and dedicate everything to reproduction. So they fight a lot, they travel a lot, they don't sleep, they don't groom. Because they need to produce so much sperm, they have very large testes, which means they have very high levels of testosterone and cortisol, which are really massive stress hormones. So their bodies effectively eat themselves. And when you cat have caught, so north, some populations of northern poles are suicide reproducers. This is an antichinus, which is um, about this big, uh, species of carnivorous marsupial. When you catch a male northern quoll at the end of the breeding season, they are completely bald, covered in scabs, covered in fleas, covered in ticks. Their bodies are just shutting down. And the females have produced this 
um, to maximise the uh, kind of competition between men and males. And then what happens is they obviously they get pregnant, they produce young, and then all of the males are dead. So there's no competition for food. So the females have totally gained the system when it comes to the suicide of reproduction that the force in males to evolve in this way. Um, and yet, when we have our friend John Gould describing Australian mammals and marsupials, and they are a very uh, low form of animal life, indeed the lowest among the mammalia. Um, now, I hope I've convinced you that isn't true and what they do is absolutely amazing. But why, I argue in, in practice matters, why this is important, is two reasons. One, one, I'll, one I'll just mention briefly, although it is very important, and that is to say that all of those colonial descriptions of what Australian mammals are like are deeply entwined with how Australian Aboriginal people were described at the same time. So primitive, uncivilised, inferior. So the, the colonisation of Australia was justified through this notion of terra magis. It's a legal argument, it's no one's land. But Australian First Nations people were not civilised enough to manage their own land. Well, my argument here is that that suggestion was strengthened by painting the whole of Australia, its, its people and its animals, in this inferior light. Um, but what I'll focus on to finish is that Australia, the other reason this is important is Australia has the worst extinction rate for mammals in the world. So if you look at all of the mammals that have gone extinct since the European invasion of Australia in 1788, over a third of them lived in Australia. So Australia has, has decreased its species count by 37% since the European invasion. Over a third, so all, a third of a third, all mammal extinctions have taken place there. And pretty much every surviving species, with a few exceptions, have decreased their population and range size by 90-something percent. So Australia is a really bad place to be a mammal. Um, and that's because of invasive animals that Europeans have brought, so cats and foxes particularly, but also sheep and cows and rabbits and deer and pigs and goats and buffalo and camels and hare and polecats and squirrels and plenty of other things, rats and mice. Um, the other reason is habitat loss and continued... Uh, con uh, the, the scale of habitat loss on a yearly basis in Australia is is absolutely jaw-dropping. My point here is that if we continue to describe Australian animals as these weird little evolutionary curios that kind of at a dead end, evolutionary dead end in some backwater on the other side of the world, it suggests that they're at fault for their own extinction, that they are not evolved enough to cope with what's going on. Obviously, if you cut a koala's tree down and then blame the koala for dying, it's, it's a pretty flawed argument. So I'm saying, yes, it might sound a little bit playful to describe them as weird and wonderful. It might sound um, a little bit celebratory, but that notion just isn't helpful for uh, conservation today. And um, there's so many problems, so many political issues that the conservation Australia is facing at the moment that they need every little bit of help they can get in saying this is important. Um, so I would just argue that we get rid of the weird and and focus on these are wonderful, amazingly, perfectly adapted animals. Um, and I will end there. Uh, we've got time for questions, I think, so uh, I'm happy to hear. I'm interested to know at what point is the definition does slightly more than average nutritious sweat become milk. And so I guess also I'm assuming that it contains protein and fat, and therefore it must have some sort of mechanism to produce that without actually having proper mammary glands and such. Sure, so the, the question there for people online is, is what I, I described what platypuses do to produce milk is they sweat out their young. At what point is, you, can you say nutritious sweat is milk? I've, I've used the word sweating there in a pretty loose way. So they have mammary glands, and, and so they, they do produce a, a kind of milky milk with lactose. Is it got lactose? I assume so. It's, yeah, it's, it is, by definition, milk. So they're not sweating it out, they're kind of oozing it out. That's my poor choice of words there. It's an interesting story, though, because even that was contentious, the two platypuses produced milk, and they, Richard Owen, who is famous for being the first man, the first person to use them, to, to name dinosaurs, 
he kind of described many of the massive extinct animals of the past. He was very strongly in the platypuses do not lay eggs camp, and very strongly in the platypuses are mammals camp. And I think the reason for that is that he believed that doing something so reptilian and uh, as, as laying eggs kind of dragged mammals down into the mud with amphibians and reptiles, and that was a kind of moral problem. But he tried to get his colleagues in Australia to send the kidney, attend the platypuses like every week of the year um, because they kept not being able to find mammary glands, they kept not being able to find milk. Um, but it turns out that if I am a platypus, when they are not breeding, their, their mammary glands are tiny. When they are breeding, they cover their entire bodies and like up on round to their backs. So eventually he was sent a platypus and just, that was nursing and skinned it and the milk came out and then he tasted the milk. Now this is an animal that had been preserved in spirits in Australia. So it would have been at least dead for six months, at least. And he said he only tasted the preserving alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, very long answer to your question, sweating is the one word which I should not have used. They produce milky milk. So they, quite, what sort of level of protein of, of fat? Really fatty, yeah. Really fatty milk, because so the question was what level of protein? Really fatty milk. When a, when a platypus is born, it's, it's about 15 millimetres long. When it leaves the nest, it's about, well, it's, it's kind of 70% of its body size. So they've been suckling until they're 70% of their adult growth. So they have extremely nutritious milk. Um, so that's like, a, that's like a human child stopping weaning at four foot tall. That, that, and they, that is just from milk, so it's, it's very good. So you know, the role from initially just being sweat, but and natural places just went to Hard to, hard to say is. how it's evolved, but milk has evolved in a few different groups, including like pigeons and flies, um, and some other insects as well. But yeah, it's, it's an obvious advantage to be able to feed your babies from your own body rather than having to feed, to you know, give them food, especially when they're so tiny when they're born they can't kind of control food. Yeah. You advocated monotremes as being so wonderful. Um, but uh, I just wonder firstly what how much fossil record there is of monotremes generally and also why they're only confined to Australia if they're so wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah. but the fossil record how, I don't know how is it very big it isn't it? No. What, what? So the <laughs> question the question was what's the fossil record like of of monitoring egg laying mammals and why don't they found anywhere else. So really poor fossil record is the short answer. Um, so there is uh, kind of 200 and 150 million year old fossils and then there's a jump to, in Australia, and there's a jump to 66 million years, um, which is actually in, in Argentina. So there's one fossil found outside of um, Argentina, it's called Monotrium Argent Sudamericanum, it's not a very imaginative name, which suggests that Platypuses in the, that monitoring that game mammals evolved in Australia and then spread via Antarctica when it was connected uh, and then up into South America when it was connected. So the, the land bridge between Antarctica and Australia split about 35 million years ago. Um, when, why they didn't spread beyond that, it's very hard to say. Um, it, yeah, you, one might argue that they couldn't outcompete anything else. But as I say, the kidneys are the most widespread mammal in Australia. So they're, they're doing fine there, um, but you know, we can, we can guess why things don't work. There are three living species. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got five living species. Five, five yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> flipping heads there. Yeah. But they're really good species. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi Jack, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I just wanted to ask, we've got venomous monotremes, we've also got venomous placentals, but we don't have any venomous marsupials. Any particular reason for that? Do you know of any pseudo marsupials? And also, do kangaroos smell a curry? And also, can you feasibly make a platypus egg with tar? <laughs> um, three questions there. First one is Are there any venomous marsupials? There aren't any venomous marsupials. However, there are noxious marsupials. So, the striped possum is a tropical species, or it's a few tropical species in North, uh, North Queensland and also New Guinea. And they are effectively um, they do the same things as woodpeckers do and as eye-eyes do, so the, the wood-boring lemurs. So striped possums have really, really um, good hearing, have really, really massive front teeth, and really, really long, in the case of 
In the case of IIs, it's the third finger. In the case of striped blossoms, it's the fourth finger. Um, so they listen for wood-boring beetles in the wood. When they hear them, they bite a hole out, and then they use their long, skinny finger to hook it out. So you might think they're like IIs, but they are better than IIs because striped blossoms are black and white, and we think that is a warning colour because if you attack them, they produce noxious chemicals. So they are aposomatically marked like bees and wasps. Um, so no venomous mosquitoes, as far as we know. Um, second question was, do kangaroos smell of curry? Not in my experience. No. <laughs> um, uh, third question was, can, yeah, can you make egg custard out of uh, egg-laying animals? Yes, that is a, an old platypus and a kidney joke. They are the only animals that you uh, produce their own custard because we've got milk and eggs. <laughs> I'm that. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't really, I'm not sure I got your um, the argument quite right, but it, I don't quite understand why having all the females um, breeding and coming into breeding season at once would increase male competition. I would have thought it would decrease. It. So if they're all coming into, into heat at once, then either the males breed then or they don't breed at all. So that's their only window to breed, so it maximizes competition. And they have to they have to travel for like, so they will try and make as many females as they can. Those females might be very well spaced out, or they might be in a clump of several females and the other one is 10 kilometers away. So in order to, to have an impact on the next generation, they need to be mating constantly throughout that window because that's their only chance. So does, does that make sense? I don't think it, does, does that really increase the competition male to male? Yeah. I surely wouldn't if there was only one female at a time that, would, uh, that, was, that was receptive, then, uh, then that would be the ultimate amount of male and male competition. Mm -hmm. Sure, but they, because they're trying to make this all of the females, so they're, that, yeah, that's how it would work. Like they, if there were only one female, there would be a lot of competition, <coughs> and she would be in charge of who was mating. Um, but because the males are not trying to mate with one female, they're trying to mate with 20 females. Yeah. I don't know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, you said the platypus will basically live wherever there's suitable water. I mean, obviously, it's very limited fresh water, but um, what's the conservation status? Good question. So the question was, I said platypuses live wherever there's permanent fresh water, but what's the conservation status? So they have just, um, it's different in different states. So just last year, or 2021, um, Victoria has listed them as, as uh, endangered. Um, they're fine in Tasmania. Uh, they are critically endangered in South Australia. And I think near threat, I think near threat in Queensland. Um, but the problem is, is that we have no good sense of what their baseline was. So platypuses were hunted until every state in which platypuses live um, had a fur trade, uh, and each of them protected them. And the last state to protect them was in 1912. Um, platypuses have the are the only species that have a commercially viable in Australia that had a commercially viable fur trade, so they were trapped at an extraordinary rate. Um, and there is this one uh, account, I want to say it's from the 1860s, where someone describes um, th that one of their friends who was a, a, you know, a, a, stock, a, 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 a stock, a cattle station owner, is the word, was down by the creek and heard what he thought were his cattle running through the stream went down to the stream and it was 150 platypuses he described. So we, whether that or not is true, they were certainly in higher numbers, massively higher numbers than they are now, which might explain why we didn't call back the catch 150, uh, 1400, sorry, um, the kidneys. But yeah, I th and most people who work on platypuses think they should be considered more threatened than officially they currently are. Um, so they are threatened by habitat loss, uh, pollution, but particularly kind of channelization of rivers. Um, we thought bushfires were going to have a massive impact on them because it increases ash in the water, but they seem to be coming back from, from Black Summer 2020. 
Um, the, team, the data studies they were slightly less affected by that than we thought. But, um, dogs have a big impact too. Yeah. What was the attitude of the Europeans towards thylacines? Were they just seen like uh, predators? Well, the question was what the attitude of Europeans towards thylacines. So thylacines are. Um, now extinct, they were the, the largest marsupial carnivore of modern times. I showed you the skins in my, in my first slide. They were like a wolf-shaped but stripy uh, carnivorous marsupials. An amazing example of convergent evolution where placental wolves and marsupial thylacines have evolved to fill exactly the same niche with almost exactly the same adaptations. It's incredible. Um, so Tasmania was invaded in 1803. It's the only place that thylacines lived at the time. Um, and the early industry of Tasmania was, was they're trying to build a sheep farming industry. Uh, pretty instantly, so pretty instantly, thylacines were killed, were blamed for killing sheep. Um, we now know that thylacines were very unlikely to have any impact on the sheep farming industry. And in fact, it was kangaroo dogs that Europeans had brought to hunt kangaroo because the sheep farming industry was failing. Um, so by 1830, uh, the first sheep. Um, farming corporations introduced bounties on the thylacine, and the last known animal died 106 years later. Um, so they they didn't have a very good opinion of thylacines, and the government followed those those commercial bounties with government bounties in 1888. Um, so yeah, it was one of the few examples of a deliberate extinction. Um, that was for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> we have one more question? If I may. Um, I, I was, um, saw a thylacine skull in the museum. Yeah. And it was great. Um, it's, it's astonishingly like a, a dog skull. So, what are the differences in, between dogs? The question, the question was what are the difference between dogs and thylacines because the, the convergence is astonishing. So, they, they, they are look exactly like they're both, you know, they're both pursued predators um, and they're you know, long snouted. So what the, what the differences are, are really small. So the difference between any marsupial skull, and any placental skull, is marsupials have a little shelf of bone here under their jaws. Um, they've got a different number of teeth, but those teeth are doing the same thing. So they've evolved a kind of carnassial, she a she a slicing, scissor-like teeth uh, between their molars and premolars. Um, there's a slight, there's, the biggest difference is in their wrists because dogs, wolves, have really stiff wrists for their kind of pursuit running, whereas uh, thylacines, it's, that is less important than the need to have flexible wrists to climb out of the pouch. So they don't have that um, because they need their wrists to do something else. But really, it's a, the convergence is astonishing. Um, it's one of the best examples. In fact, even in I think the fourth or fifth edition of Origin of Species, Darwin, says it as an amazing thing. But yeah, go, go and see it in the new displays. One of the hands uh, in the display in the middle is holding a thylacine skull. See, see for yourself. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jack. Can we have another round of applause? <laughs>